There are many places to buy Bitcoin. They collect your personal information and jeopardize your privacy. KYC is the illicit activity. BISC is open source. It does not collect user data. You keep your private keys, create or take offers to trade peer-to-peer, -peer, and keep your Bitcoin private and secure. What is up, everyone? Uh, this is CK Snarx here with Ansel Lindner. This is episode 16 of FedWatch. Uh, today, we got a great show lined up for you. We have updates on the Fed. We got updates on macro, specifically the EU. And then lastly, we're going to cover this Bitcoin pi price breakout. Um, Bitcoin's been stale and it's exciting to see it tick up. Before we get into that, though, let's talk about BISC. Uh, BISC is probably the easiest way to get Bitcoin with cash, with USD, with fiat. Um, without having to sign up and create a traditional exchange account with, you know, your identity and all of that stuff. All you need to do to get up and running with BISC is download the BISC software. It's completely open source. You can verify uh, the signatures from the developers. Um, you download that software, you run it on your computer, and then you can start coordinating trades, either sells of Bitcoin or buys of Bitcoin. Um, on the BISC network with people that are going to trade with you using your existing bank account, your Cash App, your, um, your Zells, all this different stuff that's already built into your bank account. This is just going to help you coordinate with different people that accept those payment methods and get you your Bitcoin without having to, uh, again, sign up with a, K a traditional KYC exchange. So make sure to go and check out BISC. It's really easy. Don't be daunted. There's a lot of great guides out there as well on YouTube walking you through every step of the process. Uh, so there's no reason why you can't get KYC free and privacy free and protected Bitcoin. Uh, so check out BISC. Second, I want to let you guys know about a event that I am personally been working on. Uh, Bitcoin Magazine is putting on a special six hour stream during Bitcoin Independence Day. I know that Ansel is dropping his book during Bitcoin Independence Day, but Bitcoin Independence Day is really important to understand the history of Bitcoin and how we got to this point and why um, Bitcoin upgrades and comes to consensus in the way it does. Uh, so make sure to check out that stream on August 1st um, at all the Bitcoin Magazine properties. It's going to be three fantastic debates as well as a lot of other great Bitcoin content. Think of it as like your Bitcoin Saturday morning special. Instead of cartoons, instead of college football, you get to watch Bitcoin greatness on Bitcoin Magazine. All right, Ansel, enough with the ads. Let's get into the show. Uh, first and foremost, how are you doing, man? I'm doing great, Christian. How are you, man? Back, back at home now, right? Yep, back at home. Uh, no longer with the rents or with the parents. Um, and yeah, just uh, enjoying back to summer. the grind. Back to the grind. Yeah. yeah. Always grinding, no matter what, man. You know me. <laughs> um, but yeah, speaking of grinding, the the Fed has been grinding. Uh, we have a <laughs> quick update here on what they've been doing. We're gonna look at their balance sheet. Um, and you know, I for those watching on YouTube, uh, you know, we're gonna start doing a lot more screen grabs in the YouTube video. So uh, I I definitely think that there's an added benefit from checking it out on video. So go and check out YouTube, but uh, let's get into, uh, into this Fed balance sheet and start walking through it. All right, for our YouTube guys, we're gonna, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so uh, this is straight from the Fed website and this shows their balance sheet. Now, obviously this is the big ramp up starting in March and it got all the way up to $7.1 trillion on their balance sheet, at least public balance sheet that they want us to see. And uh, over the last month, it's actually come, come down $200 billion. So if you think about from a tightening or easing perspective, the balance sheet has shrank $200 billion in the last month. So that's pretty significant tightening. Um, but one of the things I also wanted to point out on this is the bottom down here back in September of their balance sheet was 3.7 
trillion. And over the next six months, up until March, it got all the way up to 4.1. So that's 400 billion in six months. Uh, they want us to believe that the crisis started, this was a pandemic crisis. But uh, as you can see here, I mean, the, the, it, the balance sheet went up over 10% um, in the six months prior to the start of this crisis. So I uh, just wanted to point that out. Now to understand this little dip here, uh, we got to go and take a look at their assets or sorry, the, the liquidity swaps. And these are liquidity swaps with central banks. Uh, we've talked about them here on the show before. And as you can see in, uh, let's see, March, they started and they peaked up in May at $450 billion worth of swaps with other central banks. And then in the last month, they've sold off or they've uh, settled uh, down to $150 billion. So that's a $300 billion um, shift. So now if we go back to the balance sheet and it's come down 200, I mean, there's a difference there of 100. Um, and since these swaps are counted towards this balance sheet, um, the balance sheet other than swaps is still increasing slightly. And I haven't seen people really talk about that, but uh, that's, that's where this difference is coming from is the currency swaps are getting sold off. Um, anything on that Christian from your perspective, what are you thinking? No, that's interesting analysis and interesting to dig specifically why we see that dip in the overall balance sheet number. Yeah, I also wanted to back this chart out to um, get the great financial crisis. And you can see that uh, September, or sorry, uh, 2009, uh, it went all the way up to over 500, almost $600 billion of swap lines between central banks. And uh, this time we didn't get that high. But what's scary to kind of think about is, uh, are we actually, is this most recent peak in May, is it this very first little peak? here back in 2008. So is this just the beginning of the crisis and the next loop is going to be, you know, another 10 X on top of this. So uh, just for the folks not watching on YouTube, what you're looking at here is there is a chart that shows uh, the, the asset or the liquidity swap lines. And starting in 2008, there's a little bump. And then after like maybe was it six months later, the real, yeah. the real um, bump comes up and that, that peaks at about 500, you said 500 billion, 500 million. 500 billion. 500 billion, sorry, 500 billion in liquidity swaps. Um, so we are looking at the very first bump in this 2020 crisis. And, uh, you know, it looks smaller than the biggest bump from the 2008 crisis. But if it's just a bigger fractal of, what we're yeah. about to experience, then, you know, it's about to go parabolic, right? Yes. And it's like the pre-pump. The, 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 there was a little pre-pump in 2008 and then 2009, it went crazy. So are we just hitting the pre-pump in 2020 and then like late 2020, 2021, we see the real uh, takeoff of this crisis. It's very possible in my mind. Um, I don't think we are over it by any means. So just food for thought. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that you don't see on any normal show. So you got to, <laughs> you got to tune into FedWatch. You got to tune into FedWatch on YouTube to, uh, to get this. And I mean, if this is just the pre-pump, then I'm freaking scared. Like I'm very scared <laughs> to see what this next round of stimulus is going to look like. Well, that's all I have on this. Should we go on to our next segment here? Yeah, let's we'll do it. Are you article. still going to share your screen? Yeah, I have this, um, this is a speech. I wanted to highlight a few things. Um, I was listening to your POV episode um, a couple weeks ago now, I think the last fight night, and you guys were talking about liquidity. And I was reading through this speech by Lori Logan. She's a uh, vice president at the Fed. And I have her, if I can get up to my tabs here. I do have a bio for her. So she is the head of marketing operations uh, monitoring and analysis and her responsibilities include execution of monetary policy at the direction of FOMC. So she's pretty big there at the New York fed. Uh, and this was a speech that she gave uh, just recently where she talked about liquidity. And so I wanted to scroll down here and this is where she talks about. So um, quote, liquidity comes in many forms, 
One form of liquidity is the availability of financing for existing or new positions. I think of this as funding liquidity. Another form of liquidity is the ease with which assets can be bought and sold, often called market liquidity. Although these concepts are distinct, they are related and reinforcing. And this was the key sentence I have here is uh, when funding liability is abundant, market participants can finance the transactions that produce market liquidity. So in my mind, I'm thinking that funding liquidity is primary. Market liquidity is a function of funding liquidity. And what do you think of my interpretation on that? It sounds like that's what they're saying, but I don't really necessarily know what to make of it and what's the necessarily the difference. Well, in my, so this goes back to our definition of money because uh, money is the most liquid good, right? And so if we're talking about what is liquidity, what is the primary source of liquidity, uh, that should be money. And if funding liquidity, and that would be collateral and repo and, and all these other money market things, um, that is what money is. Money is not M2. Money is not dollars. It's actually dollars plus uh, repo plus collateral and all these things put together. Does that make Yeah, does that, make that makes sense? sense. We've been telling that story for a while yeah. now. Yeah, so they, they just haven't put that, that together. And I think that kind of um, uh, supports our point here. Should I go on? Yeah, let's do it. All right. The next part I have highlighted, uh, liquid markets allow participants to transact quickly and at low cost so they can easily adjust their positions in response to their own changing circumstances or broader market or sorry, broader economic developments. In normal conditions, the market for treasury securities and MBS are highly liquid. And I highlighted MBS here because um, the reason why MBS is highly liquid is because it's securitized, right? They, they uh, mortgage backed securities are bundles of securities and different tranches and stuff to make on purpose to make them highly liquid, but mortgages themselves are not liquid. I just wanted to throw that in here. Um, confidence in the liquidity of treasuries persuades investors to accept lower yields on their securities. And because treasury interest rates are a benchmark for other, many other rates, these lower yields ultimately re reduce borrowing costs for families, businesses, and state and local governments. Um, so that just kind of talks how they're pushing liquidity through the market. The next. Yep. They're lowering the cost to access what you, the, the capital that you want. Yes. That's their, their plan. Um, the next part I wanted to highlight, they come down here and um, in this section, how have, how have the federal reserves asset purchases supported smooth market functioning? Uh, she starts off in the first paragraph, pessimism and uncertainty about the economic outlook as large segments of the economy were shut down, combined with concerns about markets' ability to keep functioning in a remote environment resulted in a strong desire for cash. Um, again, she, I think she has this first section correct, pessimism and uncertainty about market uh, economic outlook. That's correct. But the second part doesn't necessarily follow. Um, do you have any comment on that? I mean, I can relate to wanting cash in those moments. And I feel like anecdotally, a lot of people said, this is what cash is for. You run to cash during uh, uncertainty. So, I mean, I definitely in my personal life can relate to uh, the, the cash there, the, the scram, the, the, the run for cash that we, it looks as though happened um, you know, during that, that first kind of COVID related market crash across, uh, equities and stocks or equity stocks in crypto. Yeah, but it started way before that. So I, I think what they're, they're trying to pin on the shutdown and I don't think it's necessarily due to the shutdown. I think, uh, the shutdown was just an excuse. Just yep. I mean, that's definitely what you're showing in the, the chart earlier before we got into that is that. You know, this stuff did start like the the uh, the repo actions started, you know, a whole six months before Corona even became a thing. Yeah. OK, moving on to my next highlight here. I just have uh, um, I, this jumped out at me like and it really hits. This is the kicker. Uh, the challenges were particularly notable in off the run treasuries 
a sector where some dealers at times were reportedly reluctant to make markets at all. So for just the listeners, uh, off the run and on the run. Off the run treasuries are kind of older treasuries. They maybe, you know, uh, say they have a five-year maturity and it's two years into that. So those are off the run. On the run are fresh off the, print, off the printing presses treasuries. Uh, so during the crisis, they had a bifurcation between fresh treasuries and older treasuries. And that kind of warps the mind. Like what's, what's the risk-free rate? What is the risk, riskless capital or riskless, riskless collateral in the system? Um, and if some people are reluctant to make markets at all uh, and funding liquidity is what money is or is the primary mover, um, this is, it, it is, you know, uh, an existential risk. I don't know. I'm trying to dive into this deeper. What, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I, I think my, your opinions are, are better than mine here. Um, but what it sounds like is the market is trying to tell them something and they're not listening. So uh, they're not like, she's, a, she's kind of addressing like, hey, there are issues here. This is how this works. Um, and for whatever reason, you know, it can be the virus or it can be something else she's noting that it's not necessarily working and we have to step in and make sure that it works uh, rather than, you know, trying to go to the root of the issue. They're just kind of, uh, you know, they're just kind of, uh, what's the word? They're treating symptoms of, of like the issues that they're, that they're discovering or they're pointing out. Yeah. Um, Jeff Schneider had a really good analogy about uh, a bucket with holes in it. So, they, they see the water line going down inside the bucket. And so their solution is to put more water in the bucket, not plug the holes, right? Um, and if people are reluctant to make markets for off the run treasuries, that's a, a very significant hole in my mind. I don't know if you can backfill it. Well, we're going to find out, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, last, last part on this. Uh, just scroll down to the bottom here. So they don't know. And they're starting to ask themselves these questions. I, I believe they're really starting to ask the, themselves this, these zero dollar questions and things because uh, she has some uh, parting shots here at the end. Uh, what factors made these markets vulnerable to the abrupt deterioration in functioning that we saw in March? Could changes in regulations, data availability, or market infrastructure make market functioning more robust to future shocks? And what role do funding markets play? What role do funding markets play? And that is what she said is the primary source of liquidity. And then she ends with what do, what role do they play? So, I mean, so essentially she's saying like, Hey, the whole point of funding markets is to make sure that there's money in the system and that money is available for people to do economic actions. And then she's saying, what's wrong with the funding environment is, or the, the funding markets environment? Is that like really kind of how it comes for full circle? Yeah, well, I just see she's building this up saying, hey, the funding market is primary or funding liquidity. And at the very end, after this big, long, like, I don't know, three page, uh, probably 30 minute presentation that she gave here. Uh, she's like, well, what role do funding markets play? We don't know. We, we don't know how, what we should be looking at. What, what factors made these vulnerable uh, markets vulnerable to the abrupt deterioration in functioning? So she's asking these questions like, well, we kind of now have this idea that funding li li uh, liquidity is primary, but how do they work? That's what I get from reading this. Yep. Well, and Jeff Schneider talks about this all the time is that the Fed doesn't even understand its place in the system. No. Um, so it, I mean, it's, it's not a shock that now, uh, you know, these folks working at the Fed are pointing out that one, like, this is how the system works, but two, we don't quite understand, you know, what all these pieces do. Yeah. And after the great financial crisis, and then after this recent crisis, like they noticed that, oh, it's something stemming from repo. Uh, I wanted to share a couple of her charts here, if I can pull up the right thing. So this is just a PDF of this of this. So you can click on it down here to get the, figures. everything is going to be in the show notes. Yeah. Um, 
I wanted to bring up this. So I don't know if how well this shows up, but uh, the 2000, it shows the 2008, 2009 crisis and it has uh, repos. So repurchase agreements and right before you see a little gray area here. So there was some problem with the repo market prior to 2008 or in 2008. And then we had the big crisis. And this time you saw the same exact thing. Um, a little bit of gray in, on this chart right before, you know, the last six months before, before March, we kind of covered that. But now they kind of understand there's something to these funding markets. And now they're starting to ask questions. So that's all I had on this. Something that's interesting about this chart too is that in the moment of, of uh, I guess, panic, it looks like right before the panic, the repurchase agreements kind of spike. In the moment of panic, credit liquidity facilities spike, um, central bank liquidity swaps spike, um, but those eventually taper off. But what continues to grow after kind of like this moment of panic is, uh, is treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. And then we're seeing that kind of replay out again uh, with 2020 um, is first you see the repo and then you see the spike across everything. And now it looks like the credit liquidity facilities and the central bank liquidity swaps are dying back down. But it, I mean, we only see a sliver on the chart of what kind of what's happening next, but I'd be interested to see if um, the amount of uh, in billions of treasuries and, uh, mortgage backed securities continues to increase on their balance sheet. Well, I, I have a feeling that this go around, um, instead of this light blue section on the chart, which is mortgage backed securities getting larger, I think we're going to see these currency swaps getting larger. So we did see them back in 2009 and 2012. Um, we saw them just recently, but I think those are going to take much more headline headlines going forward as we kind of let, alluded to in the beginning. And why do you think that just because uh, mortgage defaults are not kind of like the core of the issue this time? Correct. Yeah. And if you look back to 2009 on this chart, it's the mortgage backed securities, they came in late. It was six months or so until they figured out they need to start buying some mortgage backed securities. Uh, this time, I think it's going to be somewhat similar. Maybe six months from now, we'll see a big spike again in these uh, liquidity swaps because uh, I mean, uh, the underwriting thesis here is that uh, we're in a deflationary spiral with the dollar and the uh, emerging markets and other markets are going to need dollars more than, than we do here. So it's going to be, you know, kind of an overseas crisis and we're going to try to fund the world, so to speak. So what, what does that look like? We're giving them liquidity and we're just taking assets off the market? Yeah, I mean, well, those liquidity swaps uh, are the where they, we take their foreign currency and we hold it, uh, or the the central bank holds it and gives them dollars, and then they have to pay that off. I mean, they usually have like a three month term on those. Yep, and that's why we're seeing this initial kind of drop down um, mm -hmm. in liquidity swaps on the balance sheet. Yep, and it's so funny that they can never think past you know two weeks down the road, so. Uh, after three months comes up and now they're all, they're all having to close down these liquidity swaps. I can just picture in my mind foreign bankers saying, oh man, it's getting tight. It's getting tight. And then all of a sudden, boom, there's another crisis. And they can never see over the horizon two weeks. Interesting. And speaking about foreign bankers, do you want to jump into uh, our Euro focused content? Yeah, I don't know if I had to share my screen for this, but I can. Okay, so you guys probably heard, the listeners have probably heard about this, uh, the EU Recovery Fund, um, but they you know, have their EU summits and they discuss their budgets. Well, the, the normal budget for the EU is about a trillion euros a year. And this time they were gonna add 750 billion euros uh, for this uh, pandemic recovery and um, how that broke down is it was a big point of contention and it went on for a long time. It was the longest uh, EU summit in 20 years. So it took them a, like a week to figure this out. And they, at, 
certain points, I mean, it was political theater, but at certain points they were like, we don't know if we're going to find a deal. And then all of a sudden, Oh, we made some progress. Oh no. Now we don't know if we're going to find a deal. And you know, it's like the, they try to keep you in suspense and make you think that they're working hard and all this stuff, but really they knew that they were going to get this deal. And uh, what it breaks down to is um, 390 billion. And these are supposed to be grants given out to the hardest hit countries from the pandemic and then 360 billion in loans. So any thoughts on that? Oh, I can't hear you. Sorry. No, uh, I was, uh, <laughs> I was muted. Apologize about that. Uh, I don't know why I keep muting myself. <laughs> All right, let's start over. Oh, I was just, um, uh, I was just going through the uh, 750 billion and then 390 of it is grants and 360 is loans. Any initial thoughts? Yeah. I mean, in terms of, in terms of like, what's the difference between a grant and a loan? Um, do, like, what are the chances that these loans actually get paid off? Because it seems as though all the loans that the Fed is making are, you know, eventually turning into future grants. Yeah. Well, the way that these things are paid back is was part of the issue that they built up as the problem. And if we scroll down in this article that I'm sharing on YouTube again uh, for those guys. So we, we really... Uh, think YouTube is probably going to be our best medium because we do a lot of charts and things. But um, so, how will it be paid back? They have this as a section in this article. Um, the 390 in grants are actually going to be paid back by the EU. So they're going to tax member states of the EU to pay back that, and that was the crux of the issue. Because if, say, Italy is getting a lot of money, uh, Germany or Poland or um, uh, Denmark, they didn't want to pay for <laughs> paying off the Italians rescue package. Does that make sense? Yep. But that's what's going to happen anyways. Yep. That's what's going to happen. And they're, they're cheering this as, Oh, uh, an increase in fiscal cohesion in the, in the Eurozone. But re in reality, I think this is going to come back to bite them because a lot of these uh, frugal States or the fiscally conservative uh, States are going to, fight harder or take this as an excuse to like maybe have a referendum on being in the EU in general. So. So, I mean, are there any updates around like the German courts and the order to stop doing QE? No, I knew, <laughs> I knew we were going to touch on that and I couldn't find anything. Um, gosh, it's gotta be like 15 days left. So we'll see. Something's got to come up in, in a short period of time. Cause they had, didn't they have 90 days to, come in line with that and it's uh they're running out of time so i mean regarding like this kind of political theater like what are what are you seeing in terms of um you know the the act that's happening uh in the eu as well as uh i guess even more globally around you know around divvying up these assets and these this stimulus Um, well, I, I think there, like I touched on there, there's a lot of uh, pushback by conservative governments in Europe that they don't like this. And there was a conference or something called Europe Uncensored. And a bunch of the kind of hardline European states, some people would call them maybe um, more right leaning states. And they like Hungary, Poland, and, and so forth. They were talking um, uh, bad-mouthing Europe. And it sounded really like these were prime ministers, you know, talking bad about the European project. Um, and that just came out last week or two weeks ago. So it is, I think, tensions are building for sure inside of the Eurozone. What's, uh, what is the, like the context of Europe uncensored was like a press conference or who was invited to that? Um, I posted it on my Twitter now. I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but yeah, it was, I think it was a virtual conference of people, heads of state or heads of, um, maybe banks or, um, social groups within each country. And it was a virtual, virtual conference. 
offer. So it was real. It wasn't like some sort of fake thing that went off, but um, yeah, it, it, I was surprised reading it. I'll, if I can find a link, I'll have you uh, throw it in the show notes. hundred um, percent. A lot of good links here. Um, so just to kind of summarize on the fed, they don't know what they're doing. They're still figuring out in real time what they need to buy in order to kind of smooth out and get the market to do what they want it to do. Um, and they're just kind of have their ears or their fingers in their ears and not listening to what potentially the market could be telling them. And a great example of that is this, uh, this bucket that's losing water analogy that Jeff gave. On the flip side, going to Europe, the dynamic is slightly different as we have member states that need stimulus and really need help and the member states that are maybe in, in better phys, uh, fiscal positions, uh, but they are essentially being, you know, having stimulus thrust upon them by the EU. Um, and, you know, it's a combination of grants and loans. And when it comes to, um, you know, the grants, everyone is responsible for paying them off. It's not just the people that receive the, the grants and loans. It's kind of socialized across everyone. So um, there is this real divide in the EU uh, where that, you know, the states that are better off want to do the grants less and the states that are worse off want to do this, the, the grants more. Um, I do yeah, find so that. Going back. Mm-hmm. Go for it. Sorry, uh, circling back on the uh, your the German court case. That's exactly what they were pointing out. Like it's unconstitutional for the the German government to pay that or to get into entangling debts, basically with the ECB. And so we'll see. I mean, it is. I think people are sleeping on this. This is a problem. And I, I saw another tweet by, uh, it was Nick Carter, I think yesterday. And he said he thinks people are sleeping on certain things with uh, the CCP. So there are a lot of uh, maybe fat tail events that could pop up here in the next six months to a year. So, I mean, regarding, regarding the kind of the, the dichotomy between the U S and the Euro, tell me, or the, the Eurozone, tell me if you agree with this. It seems as though in the U.S., the most fiscally, I guess, powerful organizations and states uh, are more or less kind of behind big government action. And the ones that are maybe in worse condition are a little bit more conservative, at least with their their political policy and their fiscal policy. And then when you're looking at Europe, it's kind of the opposite. It's a little bit more aligned. The more, um, the healthier states in terms of their finances um, are kind of pushing back on the radical, um, you know, central bank policy, whereas the states that actually benefit from them are are firmly behind that activity. Uh, what do you, what do you feel like, is that observation accurate? Um. I would, I think I would agree with your European one, uh, but for the U S I don't agree. Uh, I think that um, you said that bigger States with bigger budgets are being less fiscally responsible. Sure. Or maybe they're just, they're, they're more big government in general, but maybe that's just an, uh, a false equivalent. Well, I, I think this, the Metro biggest Metro areas. So the biggest cities are that way. Um, But I think that's kind of natural in a way because you're closer to your neighbors and it matters. Like, for example, if you live in an apartment, you have to deal with your neighbor's noise. But if you live in a suburb, in a house, you don't really have to deal with your neighbor's noise. So um, I think there's, there's certain aspects of living closely in cities that lends itself to more of a liberal or uh, big government type stance. Gotcha. I guess that makes sense. And that's probably true across the globe. Yeah. For sure. I mean, I was just trying to make a connection here, but maybe there, there isn't one that exists. Um, let's, let's jump into Bitcoin. I mean, right now, again, it's, it's Tuesday morning, uh, but we're sitting just under 9,400 on the price. Uh, I mean, I have to admit, Bitcoin's price has been quite frustrating at the time. What's your TA on it? Well, we broke out of this pattern, uh, hopefully to the top side, but at the first sign of resistance, we kind of have slowed down here. So we'll have to see how this develops, but I think it's pretty bullish uh, for the midterm. I mean, breaking out of this kind of triangle pattern is uh, 
good. Hopefully it's not a fake out. So I know, again, this is not necessarily Bitcoin, but um, when it comes to like the crypto ecosystem, like the, you know, the speculation and excitement around price action is starting to really pick up. Um, does like the, does like the trading activity on the altcoin side of things have any positive or negative effects on, on Bitcoin fundamentally in terms of, you know, outlook, price, that kind of stuff? Um, sorry. <clears throat> so does altcoin trading have, uh, the volume picking up have anything to do with Bitcoin or does it have a, an effect on Bitcoin? Is that what you're asking? Sure. Does Bitcoin stand to benefit or is it being hurt by this activity on, on the altcoin side? Um, <laughs> I don't think it matters, man. I think that, uh, it's, I mean, this is one of our areas of disagreement. I think you might say that, it is good for Bitcoin because it, it drives attention, you know, it drives a news news cycle and, and all these things. Um, I, I think if there is any effect, it's probably negative. Um, so no, I, I think overall it probably doesn't have any effect at all. So it doesn't matter, but if it is, it's negative. Okay. I mean, we can agree to disagree <clears throat> there. Um, Personally, I think that Bitcoin's just anti-fragile, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm just kind of curious, like, there's, I'm just curious if, like, you know, sure, Bitcoin's flat, but um, is there momentum building up regardless? And is is that going to spill into Bitcoin or not? I'm not sure. Um, what do you think is, like, the biggest driver of, of price increases at this point? Is it just kind of market moves or or is it more, is it more about, um, you know, liquidity drying up because of having like, what do you think are like the drivers here? Yeah, I think it's supply and demand. So the supply is, is, has been shrunk from the having, and uh, there's also institutional demand coming in, you know, with grayscale and there's a, a whole bunch of other institutional products that are getting made uh, and, uh, options are getting really big. I mean, there's a bunch of different ways to trade and to own Bitcoin. And so I think that that is the underlying current is just more um, professionalization of the space is the big thing. And slowly but surely, you know, coins are going to make it into cold storage. And as coins go into cold storage, it's just going to keep uh, the price ticking up. Uh, of course, we will have sell offs. We'll have booms and where it might go up 10% in a day. And then we'll have times where it goes down 10% in a day. But overall, if you zoom out and you look at maybe the say 50 day moving average or something like that, uh, it's going to be relatively straight going upwards from here, I believe. Until the blow off top and you're muted. In what, in what case do you see potentially Bitcoin price can, uh, could take a big hit? Um, could, do you think that we could see something where uh, stocks crash again before the next big leg up of stimulus and uh, people that, you know, need to get dollars are forced to sell some of their Bitcoin winnings and, uh, and go into and, and, you know, go into dollars in order to, uh, to get liquidity. Is there a chance that we see a repeat of, of like that happening again? Yeah, I would think so. Um, it would be similar to last time, but, probably less dramatic. Um, there's, there's a lot of different reasons why Bitcoin could drop 10% in a day, uh, uh, an exchange hack, people panic, you know, anything that would cause panic, uh, could easily drop Bitcoin 10% and then, but it can return back up to the average in just, you know, 48 hours or something after that, it would be back up to the average. So, um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, kind of. I mean, but more specifically, like, if there's if there's going to be a pending shakeup in kind of global markets, um, like how how does that do you think affect Bitcoin uh, just even in the short term? Um, like for example, just to kind of like bring it back into context, um, you know, during Black Thursday, which happened in March, um, you know, equity sold off and so did Bitcoin. Um, and there's analysis showing that almost all of the Bitcoin selling off was like fresh coins. Um, and that uh, hold, like holders were taking those coins off the market and moving it into cold storage. 
um, like, is Bitcoin in a fundamentally different place now than it was back in March? Do you think that like uh, Bitcoin's price price wise may be uh, insulated a little bit from that kind of a market panic, um, or are we pretty much in the same position? Yeah, I think so. I mean, that was one of these cyclical panics. So, um, like in 2016, we had the Bitfinex hack that the price dropped 30 percent or 40 percent in a day uh, and a lot of that selling any uh, selling volume got absorbed right there and then any dip after that was less right because the selling had been absorbed earlier uh, so yeah i do think that this crash in march probably sucked a lot of the the weak hands they say or uh, any sort of selling that's going to happen over the next six months probably happened back then right so that's fundamentally bullish. Gotcha. So you expect if there is isn't uh, like a big equity tank uh, that, you know, Bitcoin is fundamentally in a better position in terms of uh, the profile of holders who could sell um, being, you know, much stronger. Yes. And I can see a 10% sell off. Like, like I said, but uh, I don't think we're going to see a 50% sell off or whatever it was back in March. Yep. Okay. I mean, makes sense. Um, outside, outside of just Bitcoin price talk, um, other fundamental things that are happening. Uh, there's a lot of talk about, um, soft fork activation. I think that's something that we want to uh, touch on at Bitcoin magazine more. Um, Aaron Van Wordham just put out an article, uh, kind of summary, summarizing the different, uh, soft fork paths that are being uh, discussed as well as, uh, past soft fork activations. Um, do you, like, what's your kind of take on, on that discussion in general? It does seem as though there's some PTSD from SegWit2x and not sure if, if developers are you know, taking SegWit's difficulty to activate too much into account and applying it to all future activations. Um, what's your take on, on that? Yeah, this is a good time of year to talk about this being Independence Day. Uh, but the... I think there's been some reluctance to talk about it because of this PTSD. So, uh, so may, big core developers might have a, an opinion, but they're reluctant to share it. You know, they're reluctant to take any sort of um, leadership role and for good reason. And I think that's pre probably really smart that they don't do that. Um, I think BIP9, which is, it caused all the controversy around SegWit, right? It, it added in different incentives to the core Bitcoin incentives, and that caused problems. Uh, as soon as they, the user activated soft fork came about with the flag day, it kind of righted those incentives or scrubbed the, the new incentives out, then we got it activated. So I, I would support any soft fork probably if I thought it was a good idea, uh, uh, independent of the activation mechanism, but I think BIP9 is a horrible idea to use. So in particular, BIP9 is the minor signaling uh, methodology. And what's the threshold that is supposed to be, uh, that, that we're supposed to get to in order to activate something with BIP9? Well, with SegWit, it was 95%. So 95% of blocks had to be signaling SegWit or seg SegWit readiness. Uh, but it has, they, they've used it for other softworks in the past. And I think those other times it, uh, just from recollection here, I think there was a problem with people signaling that they were ready when they weren't. So they signaled up to a 95% readiness for say a previous soft fork before SegWit. And when it came about, uh, well, whoops, only 25% of people were actually updated. And they were just signaling their their readiness. So there, there's some some issues with that. Uh, there's also that kind of arbitrary time frame where there's a year. Uh, it was activation within a year, and if it didn't activate within a year, then we'd go back to the drawing board with SegWit. Um, I don't know. Maybe they'll do some sort of hybrid thing, like fifty percent signaling with uh, within two years, and I, I don't know. It's a uh, it's a cluster. I say just put a flag day out there. If people don't want to upgrade, they don't have to upgrade. Yeah. So run, let them run the old software. That's fine. 
So, I mean, like, and I know that you're not a developer, but like how, how big of a percentage of the network do you think you would need to feel comfortable to run a new client or to run a, a new version of the code? Myself, not, not very many. Like I would run it by myself, but if I'm a big business um, with millions or billions of dollars riding on this decision, yeah, it would take me a long time. I would have to, uh, I mean, there could be a consortium say of exchanges that get together and be like, Hey, look, we're all going to upgrade and run this. Are you on board? Let's work together to get this going. Um, it shouldn't necessarily be inside of the code inside of some central Bitcoin core type, uh, decision-making process. This should just put out the upgrade, let people upgrade. It, it will activate on this day and let people figure it out. All right. So you say flag day and leave it up to the people. Keep it simple. Yeah. And again, it's a soft work. So if they don't want to upgrade, they don't have to, it'll be fine. Yep. All right. I mean, I'm, I'm for that again. Uh, there's a lot of strong opinions on soft forks versus hard forks versus whatever, but I think the most important thing is that users get to run their code. And if the code works with the rest of the network, then it works. And if it doesn't work the rest of the network, then they're running a fork and they're not bothering the network. So, um, well, it seems like a, a win it, win. Yeah. To bring it back to the fed, you know, the central planners over there at the fed, they think that they, they're so smart and they know how to do this right. And look, they don't even know how funding liquidity works. So I say, stop the central planning as do as little as possible, get that code together, get it published and let the people figure it out on their own. All right. And I think that's a good place to end the show. Let the people figure it out. Um, we'll let the developers hash it out um, on Bitcoin independence <laughs> day and, and on the YouTubes and Twitter and all that good stuff. Um, if you want to get, be a part of the debate, uh, make sure to, you know, get involved with the Bitcoin community. I think one of the most rewarding things for me was getting involved in the Bitcoin community. And uh, I can't imagine from when I started as a Bitcoin noob to where I am today, uh, how many amazing people I've met. So uh, be a part of Bitcoin. You can, everyone is, is a part of Bitcoin that is uh, actively running the code and, and being a part of the social layer. So you can do that too. And uh, while you're doing that, make sure to help promote FedWatch. Uh, so give us a retweet, give us a like, uh, give us a review on Bitcoin Magazine podcast and uh, go give Ansel a follow at Ansel Lindner at Bitcoin Markets. Give me a follow at CK underscore Snarks. Uh, thanks everyone for listening and yeah, uh, be good and stay safe out there. Bye.